Good evening. My name is Suzanne Stanis. I'm the Director of Heritage Education for Indiana Landmarks. I'm also a member of the Planning Committee for the Preserving Historic Places Conference. Welcome to our series of virtual conference sessions leading up to our in-person conference in South Bend, September 28th through October 1st, 2021. All of our previous virtual sessions are available on our conference website. Just search Preserving Historic Places Conference. We have a large audience tonight, and for many, this may be your first uh, contact with our Preserving Historic Places Conference. This annual event is over 50 years old, and it brings together a diverse audience of preservation professionals, grassroots organizers, property owners, and historic architecture enthusiasts for two and a half days of educational sessions and networking. We invite you to check out the Preserving Historic Places website for more information. The conference would not take place without the generous support of our partners, the Indiana Division of Historic Preservation and Archaeology, Indiana Landmarks, Indiana University, and St. Joseph County. And thanks uh, to our additional sponsors who help keep our registration fees affordable and provide scholarships. Those include the National Park Service, the Cornelius O'Brien Lecture Series, RC Engineers, the City of South Bend, the Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority, Visit South Bend, Marvin Windows, Wiss Janney Elsner Associates, and additional support from Berglund, Cultural Resource Analysts, Historic Preservation and Heritage Consulting, Indiana Archaeology Council, Old National Bank, Ratio Architects, and RE Diamond and Associates. Be sure to check out our online look at the Century of Progress houses and mark your calendars for our next Preserving Historic Places session on November 19th. This session is being recorded and will be available shortly after the presentation. A couple of quick housekeeping things. We're using the webinar version of Zoom today, so your microphones are muted and your video is hidden. Um, please feel free to submit questions through the Q&A feature, and you're welcome to use the chat to share additional information. Now, on to tonight's program. Sometime in the 1980s, I got my first look at the Century of Progress houses. I was with a colleague from our South Bend office, and we were walking along the street admiring them. And the daughter of the current occupant of the Florida Tropical House was out raking the lawn, and she said, would you like to come inside? And we said, well, yeah. Uh, and even though the house was uh, kind of tired at the time and they weren't investing in it, that staircase and mural were just remarkable. And it really sparked an interest and memorabilia collection for myself from the Century of Progress World's Fair that continues today. My colleague, Todd Zeiger, who directs our Northern Regional Office, has seen the transformation of these houses and perhaps best embodies the phrase, preservation takes patience. As you'll learn, we are not done yet. Todd will provide us with background on these incredible houses and moderate a discussion with uh, three of our current leasees. Remember to submit your questions through the Q&A feature and we'll work them in throughout the conversation. Now I'll turn things over to Todd. common experience coming to those uh, Century of Progress houses and they, they come back year after year to see these places and they tell the story of growing up nearby or going, going to those houses and walking by them. So, hey, thanks for coming out tonight. We hope to give you a, an overview of uh, where the houses came from at the Century of Progress, uh, how they got over to the uh, southern tip of uh, Lake Michigan, some before pictures, and then we'll turn it over to uh, Ross Gambrell, the, the Ross Stone House, and Bill and Lisa Beatty to give some inside story on what they've gone through on these restorations. We get to tell the story, uh, but these folks are the heroes, and so you're you're really lucky tonight uh, to hear directly from them. So that's what we're up to. Make sure you turn in your questions because we're glad to answer them towards the end. So the Century of Progress um, started out over in uh, in in Chicago, and from that, how does it get over? to Beverly Shores. It's quite the story, and that's what we're gonna tell you tonight. So the uh, postcard image on the right there is right after the houses were moved over to uh, Beverly Shores. 
For those of you joining us from maybe not Indiana, maybe a quick geography, there we are in the middle of the country there, Indiana. Uh, more specifically though, where we're talking about was the Century of Progress in Chicago, uh, there were the star, and then the houses ended up down there on the bottom of Lake Michigan and the other star. So we'll tell the story, but we start in Chicago. So this is an image of the fair from 1933. Uh, to give your bearings, um, Norley the Island is here on the left-hand side of this image. To the right, you see the planetarium at the bottom. Uh, for those of you who are more familiar with Chicago, Soldier Field is just to the right of this image. What's fascinating is if you go and you look overhead today, you can still see remnants of this. Now these houses we're gonna see tonight were up where this arrow is at, the Southern tip of the fair. It's part of the home and industrial arts group. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. But when you pull up the map, if you know what you're looking at, looking straight down, you can still see re the remnants of where this Century of Progress Fair was located in Chicago. You can see the island there and really the shoreline still bears some of that resemblance from the fair all these years later. So 1933, 1934, the Century of Progress was going on in Chicago, attended by millions, a hugely successful fair in the middle of the depression. At the same time though, along the shore of Lake Michigan, a developer by the name of Robert Bartlett had this dream of developing a resort community on the shores of Lake Michigan, something similar to what you might find in, in Florida. I've always been intrigued by that. The weather's a little bit different up here in Northern Indiana, but that's all good. This was his vision. Uh, this was a, a, a rendering that he had put out there of what he saw happening in Beverly Shores. Over time it developed, but at first he had to figure out a way to get people to come from Chicago and buy property to build houses in Beverly Shores. And so what he hit upon is he was gonna buy some properties from the close of the fair and move them over to help kick off his new development of Beverly Shores. And that little uh, newspaper clipping there in the middle of that image shows you that uh, announcement of that. So that's the connection between Beverly Shores and the fair was Robert Bartlett. And he, he knew the popularity of these houses and he really wanted to build on that to have folks come out and buy some property in his new de developed um, development here. So where were they? These were part of the Home and Industrial Arts Group. And the five houses that we know as the Century of Progress District today were all grouped right by each other in that Home and Industrial Arts Group. And so the Rostone House was here. And you can see Lake Michigan in, at the top of that little graphic. The Florida Tropical House, both of them along the lake, even at the fair. Uh, the House of Tomorrow sat next to the Florida House at the fair. The Armco Faro House across the street. And then the Cypress Log Cabin and uh, Guest House was down in the bottom corner there. So Bartlett took those five houses along with another uh, half dozen or so from the Colonial Village. This is an image of the Colonial Village at the fair. And he moved them over to Beverly Shores, some by truck, but most of them by barge. And I've moved about a dozen houses in my career. It's always a taxing and challenging thing. I've never been um, brave enough to move one across Lake Michigan, but that's what he did. About 40 miles uh, from Chicago uh, to Beverly Shores as the, as the barge floats, as I guess they would say. He put them on the barge and moved them over there from the old Century of Progress site uh, down to Beverly Shores. And in fact, in February, when he was doing some of this work, a couple of them had to go hang out in Michigan City because the weather was so poor, uh, he couldn't get them up the dock uh, that had been built out into the up, out into the lake. So that's an image there. You can see the the Florida Tropical House on its barge and the and the tug uh, there to the right, uh, getting ready to push it up onto the lake. Another image that's the uh, Armco Farrow House and the House of Tomorrow uh, on its pilings getting pushed up. Uh, up onto then the street, and then again on up to the top of the dune. And so just kind of keep that in mind. It was a Herculean task to get these houses off the site in Chicago, onto the barge, across the lake, up onto the, to the street side, but then for the house of tomorrow, even up on top of the dune. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about the National Park who owns these houses. Uh, at the turn of the century, there was a lot of effort to try and promote the saving of these dunes. Um, Naturalists were bringing folks out to the Sea of the Dunes. It's a, an incredibly diverse area, uh, but there's also this debate about, are we gonna have hills? Or are we gonna have mills? And so this conversation about what's this part of the lake going to look like? Fast forward into the 1960s, Dorothy Buell and Senator Douglas uh, did a huge amount along with others to advocate to save the dunes and that grand bargain 
ended up creating the Indiana Harbor that we have today as part of the industrial side, but created the Indiana Dunes National Park uh, as part of the dunes side. And that's why we've got this amazing resource along Lake Michigan today, the Indiana Dunes National Park now, it was initially known as the Lakeshore. And you can see a picture uh, here of the Lakeshore along uh, the southern tip of Lake Michigan. And the houses are right there along that edge. And that's where Beverly Shores is. So if you think about it, they created the park in the 1960s. And so what did that mean? Well, they had to buy a lot of property that already had houses constructed. And along the way, they collected a number of historic sites, including the Bailey Homestead, which is now a National Historic Landmark, and the Shelberg Farm, which is a living history museum used by the National Park. So some of those properties they used, they are historic and they're important, but they had another problem. They had a lot of other properties that were historic, including the Century of Progress houses uh, listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So by the 1990s, these houses were really uh, starting to become a problem. Uh, the Cypress overgrown, the Armco, or the, uh, yeah, the Armco Pharaoh starting to rust, uh, the House of Tomorrow having seen better days, uh, the raw stone clad in its permastone in the Florida sitting there. And so in 1993, they were listed on our 10 most endangered list. The park had no use for these houses, uh, didn't really have the money for restoration. And so the conversation was, well, what could we do to help bring some private money to the table? Uh, and that eventually led to what we have today, which is a Century of Progress restoration project, which has now expanded actually to include other properties in the park as well. But we started with these. And so through the last 27 years or so, these houses have transformed thanks to the amazing work of the private parties that are doing it. And so tonight we'll, we'll see and talk to uh, two folks um, that have done this, the Beatties from the Florida House and Ross from the, the Rawstone House. And I'll also touch a little bit about some plans for the House of Tomorrow. So before I turn it over to the Beatties, let me give you a little bit of before and afters of the Cypress House and the Armco Pharaoh, plant a seed about what's gonna happen with the House of Tomorrow, uh, and then we'll move from there. So this is some images. This is the Cypress House uh, using the highest technology possible to uh, grade the dune there on the left with the horses. Uh, being done, the work in the winter, you can see that image of the Cypress. Uh, the sites, when we first put them on our 10 most endangered list, this is always the picture I talk about, kind of where is the property, uh, and then once it was cleared. So it really had seen, you know, much worse, had in really bad condition. And so through the years of effort on the part of the Alms family, uh, new foundations coming in, uh, the guest house was actually disassembled for a new foundation to put under it, interior elements uh, framed out, uh, and today you can see the house from the road uh, complete with its restoration. Um, part of it was a link from the front house to the back house, a modern uh, ac accommodation to allow that. Um, and so there you have the exterior today, a far cry from what it looked like in 1993. On the inside, just some quick peek of what it looks like on the interior. These are rehabilitations. And so we try and balance the best of the old and the best of the new, and I'm sure uh, our friends at the Rostone in Florida will talk a little bit about that as well. So there's some, just be some before and afters of the, of the Cypress House to give you a sense of what went into that project. Next to the House of Tomorrow is the Armco House. This is what it looked like in the 1990s. It has a very innovative structural system that in and of itself could be a conversation um, where you tilt up the outside panels. Um, I've always been curious about this sawhorse with the guy on the top with the rope. And then the poor guy underneath that giant piece of metal, uh, if the case the rope broke, but that's another conversation. Then you can hang the outside with your suit and your hat, uh, the porcelain clad enamel tiles uh, put in place for the outside. But finished on the interior, very soft, very contemporary for the 1930s. But the exterior that was hailed as farewell to the paint can had not fared so well. Uh, the rust and uh, corrosion had really been advanced Oh yes, and by the way, it didn't have a foundation. It was just I-beams on concrete blocks. And so it too involved rolling it back for the new foundation. Window restoration, involvement of the apprentice iron workers, local 395, who came to the rescue to do all of the work, turning the site into a living laboratory where they taught these apprentices how to work on this old house. And they really earned their keep uh, from the beginning. 
So the inside too was gutted, had to be to get to the structural repairs. All of it was documented. Uh, and then today, when you, we do have the tours, you'll be able to come and see uh, the inside uh, in its finished state. And there it is on the dune. Let's turn our attention to the House of Tomorrow. Uh, maybe one of the more famous houses, uh, certainly gets a lot of media attention. Uh, designed by Fred Keck, here it is designed at the fair as was constructed. As he had proposed it to the fair uh, committee, this was his vision. You can see it was pretty much realized, but based on an octagon house that he had grown up nearby in, in Wisconsin. It's a fascinating story and one we hope to be able to give you uh, in the future. So stay tuned for more opportunities on that. A couple of things I want to point out though, while I have your attention, what's really remarkable about the House of Tomorrow and this House of Glass is that it predates Philip Johnson's Glass House, which is 1949 and the Farnsworth House by nearly 20 years when you think about when it had to be designed. So very much forward thinking in a structural system to allow that all glass exterior to be constructed. So here's a couple of images that, of it at the fair. You can see the car uh, in the left-hand side with its garage. And of course, to the right in that image, the infamous airplane hangar, which it had at the fair, which if you paid attention or noticed in the early graphic, the airplane hangar door actually faced the lake at the fair. So it was always just an exhibit, but they actually had a plane uh, there at the fair to show that, you know what, in the future, that's how we're gonna be living. And in that home and industrial arts group, that was the challenge to the builders. They were supposed to say, hey, look how we are gonna be living 100 years in the future. So they tried to show modern heating and cooling uh, and furnishing it very modern, which Keck also designed all the furnishings for this house. So there it is in 1934, he changed the cladding. Uh, you can see it cost all of another 10 cents to go through this. Keck actually had a concession and he charged additional money to go through it. So by the 90s, this is what it looked like. Uh, we look at the windows had all been changed out. Uh, and really had deteriorated quite a bit. And on the inside had lost most of its historic uh, interior. Uh, that's the second floor. This is the first floor. This is the area actually of the airplane hangar. And I'll just close this part of it up by kind of giving a preview of what's coming. Landmarks has formed a really dynamic team of architects and engineers to put together a plan for the restoration uh, of this house and has been named a national treasure by the National Trust that came alongside us a few years ago. It's been really a huge help. Uh, working from the archives, this house is probably one of the best documented. Uh, we have all of Keck's original drawings. And through that effort, have decided to make, make the 1933, the restoration period for this house. Keeping the best of what's still there, the original kitchen still exists, looking a little worn. Uh, but the structure is there, and I would say 60% of the original material is still in place. But then teaming that up with modern materials to make it energy efficient, kind of the new house of tomorrow, uh, moving into the next century uh, and currently evaluating heat and wind loads, uh, looking at different materials to replicate the original exterior from 1933, including the airplane hangar door in some form and putting a form of use on the inside that can actually work for modern living, including you know a space to park the car. But if you look right on the right-hand side, they're trying to get an elevator into the building so we can get up to that second floor. Very quick run through of the plans. Stay tuned. We hope to be able to come back to you and give you some more information about what's planned for the House of Tomorrow. And I can tell you one thing for sure tonight, there is nobody going to be more excited to see the House of Tomorrow started restoration than the folks I'll introduce you to next. And that's Bill and Lisa, Lisa Beatty, whose house, the Florida house, is right across the street and who have to look at the House of Tomorrow uh, every day. So as we get ready to bring them on, I'll just give you a little uh, background about the House of Tomorrow, and then we'll turn it over to them uh, for some words. So the Florida Tropical House was sponsored by the state of Florida. Uh, it was designed by an architect who hailed from Indiana, built the house in Chicago that was then moved back to Indiana. So I consider it a full circle. Uh, this is an image from the fair. They brought up palm trees and put them out there in Chicago. Uh, really quite popular for folks to view and visit this. Uh, had a bar in the corner after Prohibition ended. You can see a, a little image of the kitchen there in the left. And of course, the amazing terrace uh, that faces the lake, which is still there today. And if you have been to Miami, you know that these are, you know, part of the effort of being near the water. You got to have these outside terraces. And so that's a quick background of the Florida Tropical House, a stucco house 
built in Chicago and now sitting on uh, the shores of Lake Michigan. I hope you enjoyed that quick tour. We're gonna to turn that over now to Bill and Lisa Beatty. Uh, they can come online and talk about their experiences with the Florida Tropical House. Um, we hope that this look into these houses tonight is of interest to you. Again, don't forget to um, send in your questions so that we can be prepared to show those and answer those uh, as, you, as we go on uh, towards the end here. So there's Bill uh, on the image and Lisa. So I'll turn it over to you. You can tell a little bit about what you've been up to and then I'll be sharing some images that we've got ready for you. Okay. Okay. Can, are, are we all set? You are all set. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome to the Florida Tropical House. It's called the Florida Tropical House because it was sponsored by the state of Florida. And it was all, the only house that was sponsored by a state. The architect was a guy by the name of Robert Law Weed. And when you look at it, uh, there's great room. It's got 18 foot ceilings. It's got a loft, it's got an aluminum staircase. Hey, these are modern stuff even today. And this was 1933, pretty amazing stuff. Uh, my first wife, Marcy, and I happened to catch a news broadcast from Chicago and we caught this the tail end of it about a free house. And so, she was very interested about it and inquired about it and dragged me out there and I looked at it and I said, the place is a dump. It had been vacant for seven years <laughs> and you can see it was just overgrown and, and it had been broken into and the roof leaked and it had seven years of, of decimation. And, uh, but anyhow, she wanted to do it and I said, okay. And so we applied and went through the process and long story short, we wound up with the house. And uh, it had been initially designed by Robert Weed as a cast reinforced concrete house, which for Florida is, great because it's hurricane proof, it's bug proof, it's termite proof. And it initially was presented to us uh, as a cast concrete house. When we found that when for the fair, it was only gonna be a one year deal, they made it out of wood frame and covered it with stucco. And my wife says, we have a paper mache house. And this, this uh, awnings were collapsing and you, you could see there how they were propped up with four by fours. And uh, it just it was absolute deplorable condition. Every time we opened something up, it was a heartbreak hotel. And uh, so this is just some of the observation deck and the handrails that were missing. And uh, there were 60 feet of handrail aluminum missing. And uh, we had to replicate the eight balusters and uh, 60 feet of handrail. It uh, has many, many coats of tar paper on the roof but the thing still leaked. And uh, the one thing that we found that the area under the roof was concrete. <laughs> it was the only part that was concrete. So we started on the house and superficially it didn't look too bad. There's a picture of the aluminum staircase and the balcony and the loft. Hey, these, these are great things even today. And there's a picture of the oil paintings on the murals. 
and uh, were not part of the fair, by the way. Uh, they were removed and then I uh, had them restored, uh, but they were put in in 1935. Most of the fixtures were taken out of the house before Bartlett got it. And the ones that were remaining with the vandalism and break-ins, uh, they were, were stolen and destroyed and taken out. There was a picture of the eight foot overhang and we opened them up and it was totally rotted out. And again, the Heartbreak Hotel. It just, it just every, every time we, we open something up, there's a picture of the wiring and places where they just clipped the wires and left the bare wires inside the walls. And so we finally decided to strip the entire walls down. The plaster was all cracked. And so we took it down to the bare studs. We found many of them rotted out. And so they, we had to replace them. And uh, it just was unbelievable. The biggest heartbreak I think at, back in that time was I brought a laser level from work and put it on a threshold of the front door. And here the corner of the dining room was down over four inches. Now that's a tremendous amount of settling. And we researched it for a long time, trying to find some way to stabilize the house because it was I, it was continuing to sink about a sixteenth of an inch per year. And we found a system and we sunk 91 helical piers down to resistance. And we went underneath the uh, footings and we, with hydraulic jacks, raised the house reasonably level. Now, when I say reasonably, it, it was said that they, if they went any further, they were going to start destroying the house. So it, it stabilized with a 91 piers and uh, reasonably level. But uh, this is a, now the heating system, and in the in the in the fair, the house did not have uh, a lower level, a basement level. When they brought it over, and Bartlett brought it over on the side of the hill, he created a, a lower level, and. There is no historic value with the lower level. So we were allowed pretty much free reign in what we did. And we created two bedrooms and two bathrooms downstairs. And it is now almost a 4,000 square foot house with four bedrooms and four bathrooms. Initially it was two bedrooms with one connecting bath and that was it. But the uh, roof, we decided to put a, a rubber roof on and that was a picture of the decking that we put it. There it is again, the decking that we put down uh, on top of that rubber roof. And uh, it is works very well. And Robert Weed wanted to create the blend of the outdoors with the indoors. And that decking is what he termed three outside rooms. And there are three distinct areas of, uh, of area and three outside rooms, which are accessible by an outside stair as well as French doors from inside the loft. And this is just a picture of 
the stucco repair was just it was horrible sharp and uh, the uh, material is we had a engineer come out from the Stowe Corporation and he recommended this material and uh, the entire house was restuccoed or patched and then a paint, a pink paint, we found a area underneath a balcony that was reasonably unfaded and we matched the colors and uh, painted the entire house. This is the interior as it looks today. Uh, this is the one bedroom, this is the great room. And uh, oh, the fit fireplace on the, on the side there, on the left side, that's one of the first heat-a-later type fireplaces. And uh, it has a jacket around the firebox and it by convection draws cold air off the floor and exits, exits it, warms it and by convection. And being a Florida house, that was all that Robert Weed designed into the house. And it just takes the chill off of the house. And uh, again, it's a picture of the loft and a picture of the house during the restoration. This is the way it looks today. And the latest crisis is the lake. Uh, the lake is threatening the house and it was almost a thousand feet to the water when we got the house and we had a tremendous sand dune build up in front of the house and it had to be 40 or 50 feet. Now it's down to eight foot and it's in jeopardy with the high lake levels of, of losing the whole house. So we're in the process of constructing a seawall on top of the house, uh, in front of the house to try and protect it. And that's the latest uh, thing that our latest chore that we're doing. So we'll come to those pictures in a few minutes. Thanks for that lead in. That's gonna be where we end uh, after Ross kind of goes through his uh, introduction as well. I've got some images that, that uh, Lisa Todd, had sent me. Todd, we've got a, a lot of questions. If I could just ask a couple of them, but first we've got a technical difficulty with your screen. There's a black strip along the bottom of it. Well, that's um, exciting. Okay. So I don't know if you're if you're okay. able able to fix that, but um, just one of the questions that we had related back to the rest of the houses: What happened to um, the other fair houses? The other fair houses were demolished, except for the old North Church, which is still in Beverly Shores. Uh, when you come into town on Be come into Beverly Shores towards the lake, uh, uh, as you go about halfway to the lake, it's on your left hand side. All the other houses were demolished over the years as they were purchased as part of Beverly Shores, there's still a town there. And as those lots were bought and new houses constructed, the rest of the village was demolished essentially over time. And can you tell us a little bit about the application process for the leases? What did they have to go through in order to get one of these houses? Agree to spend the money. <laughs> Is <laughs> um, that it? <laughs> yeah, and, then, and that they were certifiably crazy to do the project. Uh, <laughs> no, it, it's a little more than that, but certainly they have to have the capacity to do the project. That's you know important, but also they have to have the passion. As you can see, these are not for the light of heart or the faint of heart projects. And so you've got to have that passion and desire to do it and the persistence to keep up with it. As you saw in just some of these pictures, what they went through and what you'll see with Ross's project, it's, it's hard. So experience with preservation, persistence and capacity to take it on financially, and then willingness to work with us and the park service on your planning. Cause it's not, you don't just get to do whatever you want to do. There's a lot of planning to that. So right. um, those would be the main three things. Yeah, well, we'll let Ross tell his story, but yeah, there are definitely a lot of questions about the erosion because I think that's been in the news. So uh, yeah, so, yeah. Well, we have some photos about that at the end. Yep. All right, thanks. So I'm gonna uh, share my screen again and try and get rid of that little black strip that you were talking about. Maybe put it up there um, to make it a little bit better. Uh, so Ross Stone House, as Ross gets his camera on and Bill and Lisa 
Um, we'll be back on to answer questions as we get to this next part. Um, so the Rawstone House, uh, sponsored by the Rawstone Corporation, uh, a man-made material, and here it is at the fair uh, as part of this effort to show how we might be living in the future. Uh, here's an image of the, of the uh, structure of that, which I think will come back to be part of Ross's conversation of the repair of that. But you can see that structure uh, in place there, and then it was uh, hung with a clad uh, stone material. Uh, but inside it was that concrete. Bill mentioned that the Florida house was supposed to be a concrete house. In fact, next door, uh, the raw stone essentially is with, a, with that concrete deck and that exterior uh, that it is there. Um, the main staircase clad in, in uh, raw stone, an amazing uh, shot there from uh, the interior and then, but yet clad again, very contemporary for the period, trying to make it soft and comfortable in this very masculine house and its design. The original kitchen had modern laundry facilities there. You can see that going on. Uh, and there it is in the 1950s, uh, clad in permastone. One of the challenges as Ross comes on is uh, the, the uh, raw stone had a, line, a high lime content. And so the, the, that acid rain, some of you may remember, uh, was not kind to raw stone along the lake and it started to fail and in the 1950s. Um, they reclad it with permastone, another man-made material. And there's Ross. Uh, so Ross, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you to, to <laughs> talk about your your experience. I've got some slides as you, you'll see as we go through here. So go ahead, I'll turn it over to you. This is Ross Gambrell. Hi everybody. And uh, oh, I guess I'll start this the same way I have in all the other ones. Welcome to this old house on steroids. Uh, the house was built at the fair to showcase a newly patented synthetic precast stone that was touted as being more durable than natural stone. Well, they lied. Uh, it was actually the very first structure that the Ross Stone Corporation ever built to showcase the house. Uh, the house was built in 101 days. They started construction uh, February 15th, 1933, and opened the doors at the fair May 27th. Um, the house was uh, unattended for 17 years when I was, I guess, do you use the word lucky, Todd? <laughs> Enough to get it. Uh, it was a perfect fit. Uh, houses made out of precast concrete our precast stone, the raw stone, concrete, and structural steel, and it was a perfect fit. I'm a journalism major who happened to spend 15 years as an iron worker climbing up on little bitty beams and putting buildings together, and I was project man one of the project managers on 760-story high-rises from Toronto to Hong Kong. So this, to me, basically was a nice little hobby project, or so I thought. It's been 18 years now, and we just finished work on the last room, the solarium, the highest room up in the house. Uh, the house is a little deceiving. From the street, it looks like a nice little house. Uh, but if you get a get to look at it from the lake, you see what a monster it is. It's 22 rooms, 7,000 square feet. Uh, which was way more than what I bargained for. <laughs> and part of the reason it took 18 years to do the work. Uh, like Todd, I am fortunate enough to have the complete set of original design drawings. The house was designed by Walter Scholler of, from Lafayette and the Scholler Corporation is still in business and they have the drawings that I've used to restore the house um, are actually printed from the original tracings that they still have. Uh, when I found, or when I first looked at the house, there were eight columns I needed to repair. Two I had to refabricate and replace, that's one of them. I missed the other 96, 104 columns had to be repaired on the house and 
took quite a bit of time to do that. Um, I've stayed as close as conceivably possible to the original design drawings. In fact, that stone that you see there, the decorative stone around the door, uh, we actually took that down. It came down in pieces. We ground it up, recast it using Portland cement as a binder and put it back up. And that is the only original raw stone that's on the exterior of the house today. The rest of the stone that's there is an exact replica of the original stone in color, texture, physical dimension. The only difference is it's made of precast concrete. So it should hold up for a substantial amount of time. That one wall that you're looking at right now, that came down in one piece. There were two, you see one person up there. There's, there was another, you can see the two people up there. They each had a crowbar and one stood on one end, one stood on the other and just popped the wall and the whole elevation collapsed uh, at once. The house had been vacant for 17 years when I got it. Had it stayed unattended for another two to three years, there wouldn't have been anything to it. It would have imploded. Uh, the only thing that was holding the house together was itself. Uh, we restored all the windows in the solarium, all the windows, uh, they're all steel windows, uh, all the first floor windows we fabricated from new because we needed the uh, parts from what was left of the windows to restore the ones upstairs. As far as the flooring in the living room and dining room, it was quarter sawn handmade oak parquet in the two hallways and the two bedrooms on the main floor, that was quarter sawn walnut, or that was, uh, I'm sorry, uh, that was uh, handmade walnut parquet. We took those floors up, basically uh, took them apart, re-glued them, re-squared them, put them back down. It took two and a half years to uh, restore the flooring. We restored all the original interior doors. Uh, that took uh, another year and a half to do. This is the replica stone and you see those clips on the right side of the screen. Uh, they're split tail clips and ironically, those are, uh, raw stone was invented by the raw stone corporation. The original stone was fastened with grommets and through bolts through the steel. And needless to say, we wrapped the house in plywood, so we needed to attach them to the face of the house. And ironically, the split tail clips were designed by the also designed by the Ross Stone Corporation in about 1936. That's a replica of the 1933 floor. They had redecorated all the houses between 33 and 34. And I had the drawings and the layout for the 33 floor. And so we did that. The red stone you see in the center is original raw stone from the floor we took up. And the black and the yellow that you see, and there's some brown on each end, uh, that was recast replica. We have since sanded that floor down and all the floors are now ready for sealer. Uh, should be sealed in the next week or two. But for all intents and purposes, the house is uh, complete at this point with, you know, some minor things, putting up a handrail here and a handrail there, putting up some blinds and the like. Uh, and so that brings us, I'm sorry, Ross, I thought you were uh, finished. So that brings us to the last part here with photos and we can get to our questions. Uh, we're about a quarter till. So this is an image um, of the current status up at the lake. And I'm sure some of us folks that are online with us tonight have read about this. So I thought we'd close up with some photos. This is before uh, the latest effort by uh, Ross and Lisa and Bill. Um, the, uh, Ross, how close was that to your back door there in that shot? About 25 feet? No, about 50 feet. And about as 50. Bill had mentioned, when I first got the house, uh, this 
and where it shows there, that was a gentle taper out to the lake. And uh, that showing there, it was a gentle taper out to the lake that was, the water was about uh, 100 yards out, about 300 feet from uh, the back of the house. Uh, this eroded uh, last January, unfortunately, uh, we did not get the winter ice shelf that we normally had. And in uh, one day in January, within six hours, both Bill and I lost almost two thirds of an acre of backyard. Uh, it was, so Bill, Bill it was scary. Lisa, it was yeah, incredibly Lisa, this scary. Is a, an image of yours and I pasted it off. This one was about 20 feet from the back of your porch. So I've got a couple images here just showing this was when Ross, I'll get to your wall. You can describe that. And then uh, Bill and Lisa, I've got your pilings coming up. Uh, this is when you were doing your work on the wall in front of the raw stone, the, the frame of that, um, uh, that sea wall that had been uh, there. And now you extended it up, what, four feet, Ross? Is that correct? Uh, we went four feet up. And what we did also, uh, four feet up from the top of the existing wall, which goes down 15 feet. Um, and you can see from this picture, uh, the top of the form is basically the top of the wall. When we finished the work, we backfilled about halfway up. Uh, and within about three days, just this last week, uh, that sand was all washed away. And now the bottom, the top five feet of the original seawall is showing. Uh, so we Bill, did... uh, Bill, if you can describe your work here with this sheet piling, um, as you come on, I'll just explain a little bit of the difference. As part of the Park Service res regulations, we had to get approval for this work and it was really repair of what was existing. They do not allow new work to go in along the lake any longer. Uh, unless it's above the high water mark. And so the two different approaches to the seawall that explains why. So Bill and Lisa, this is ongoing. Presently, I think the one picture is from today, correct? Uh, uh, yes, yes today. Yeah. pretty much. Uh, it, there had been a steel seawall, but it was inadequate and it was totally destroyed. And so this is a, new seawall, those sheets are 32 feet long and uh, two thirds of it are below grade and only one third is above grade. And uh, they were driven down by a huge rig. They've been working out there, I don't know, about three weeks. And at least now the house is reasonably protected uh, the wind today, the, they could not work because the waves were, there was no beach. And uh, so at least uh, we, we got between eight, about eight, eight, nine feet till the, from the patio to the drop off. And it had been probably 40 or 50 feet. And this last, with the lake level being so high, uh, it was nip and tuck. <laughs> so I think we're going to turn it over to Suzanne. I'm sure you've got some questions you've been compiling. So if you want to uh, throw a few of those out, we'll see where we head. Yeah, I do. Sorry about the technical difficulties. That black box moved from the bottom to the top, but I don't think it, it kept people from seeing too much. So anyway, sorry about that. It, it's on our end, uh, not on yours. But um, people are curious about how long do these leases last? Uh, so we just uh, renegotiated with it, and each of the parties now have 50 five years from 2020. Uh, and the, the companion question that usually goes along with that is, what happens after it's over? And our answer is that really this generation and the next has done its job and it's gonna be up to that group at that time. We're, our guess is the park service won't have any more money then, but who knows? Um, but they're protected for the next 55 years. We know that 
what happens after that, I think it's really on their, it's on their shoulders at that time to, to figure that out. And after all this work, uh, Beatty's and Ross, you have any regrets? <laughs> Bill, hey, Bill, what do you say? <laughs> well, financially, it was the dumbest thing I've ever done. <laughs> and, and I've done some pretty dumb things, but from a personal satisfaction, it's probably the best thing I've ever done. That's great. I, did, I, I personally did it for one reason and one reason alone. It, it gets into a long story, but I, I've known the whole story of Beverly Shores and the World's Fair Houses and that, uh, Leonard's Casino, all of it, my whole life. Uh, Theater of the Dunes, which was the Goodman Theater Company summer stock. My uncle was the stage manager. Uh, my father, I know for a fact, went through this house at the when he was at the fair. He was 17 years old. Uh, when I found out about the houses, kind of like Bill did, I go, they can't be looking for somebody, you know. So I went and asked a question that I knew the answer was going to be no, and it wasn't. Uh, but I did the house for one reason and one reason alone, to prove to myself I could. <laughs> Well, and somebody wants to know, talk about uh, that money. Uh, who's been paying for those pilings in the sand? We have. <laughs> yeah, that's not, not the park service that's been taking care of that. So we well, all- we get, we, get, we, we, get, we, get a, uh, we, we get a donation from the tooth fairy once a year. <laughs> well, we, we can't thank you enough for, for the hard work that's gone into that. Um, some, we had a question about these houses being open to the public. Uh, Todd, do you want to talk about that? Because this year is a little different. Yeah, so anytime you can walk up and just knock on Ross's door, he'll let you in, right, Ross? Is that how it works? <laughs> yeah, no, it, a lot of people think that, unfortunately. So as far as the <laughs> least, excuse me, everybody is required to open it up once a year for a tour. Uh, and we've done that for the past 20 years. Even before we had these houses leased, we were doing tours. Unfortunately, as we all know, the situation, so we just couldn't do it this year. So we are doing a the live uh, launch, uh, launch of a, of a virtual tour on November 7th. So make sure you sign up for that, give you kind of a behind the scenes look, expand a little bit more on what we could deal with tonight in a short amount of time. Uh, so that's how we're doing it this year. And that'll be live even in the future when we do resume uh, in-person tours, which we hope to be uh, next fall. We all have our fingers crossed on that. And if you do see uh, the, the little man that is by the door in just over my shoulder, uh, that's, that's kind of mini me all dressed up in the COVID, in my COVID costume for next yeah, year in your bubble. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hopefully we'll get you out of that bubble for next year. Um, yeah. To the babies, was, was the Florida Trop Tropical House originally pink? And somebody would like to know uh, what shade of pink that is. I, they might want to replicate it. It's flamingo pink. Well, what else, right? And it was pink at the fair. As far as I know, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know I've seen some really great resources for photographs of the houses uh, at the fair. I think maybe they, were, they threw the Chicago Historical Society, or if somebody wants to find out more, what's a good place for them to go and find that? Chicago, yeah, Chicago Historical Society and the University of Chicago, or UIC, uh, University of uh, Illinois Chicago, has the most complete archives of the fair. Uh, I've gone up to both places and I've seen drawings and pictures that I never knew even existed. Great. And what is it like living in one of these really famous houses? I think I read once where the babies actually had, you just found a visitor up on your sun deck or something. Like living in a fishbowl. Yeah. <laughs> Looking out, yeah. Yeah, do people do people come up to the door and just you know like hey can I look inside? <laughs> I've had them walk in, <laughs> open the door and walk in. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. and and cameras. Every time you look out the window, somebody's snapping a picture of well, not us, the house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Well, that's yeah, a... the, the area up there once, especially this summer, when Chicago closed their beaches and the Indiana News National, Be National Park became the closest beach, I cannot tell you the amount of traffic that has increased up there. Uh, it was always popular. People were always stopping out in front of these houses, looking at the little you know, plaques and things, but it is insane this summer. And I'm sure that uh, my colleague, my folks here will, will agree with that. It's, it's amazing, the traffic and it just, the privacy is, is a challenge. <laughs> privacy? What? Privacy well, well, yeah. is <laughs> The privacy for someone, Bill and Lisa, this is, this is their you know, weekend home and summer home. This is my full-time residence. And yeah, it uh, it gets trying at times. It really does. I've had people knock on the door at 10, 1030 at night wanting to come in and see. Yeah. yeah. Well, and th this is a question I've never seen, but did Catholic nuns ever occupy one of these houses? I have never heard that. I'm wondering if uh, perhaps the, we're swapping famous places where West Baden, where we had actually Jes Jesuit uh, priests. Um, but no, nobody knows of any Catholic nuns that occupied one of the houses. Oh. No, this, this house was, the park acquired the house in 1970. And from 70 to 85, they utilized the house's their ecology lab. There were actual park employees who both lived and worked here. Uh, the entire lower level, uh, like with Bill's house, the lower level wasn't at the fair. And uh, they brought the house in, jacked it up and put the foundation on in underneath it. And the lower level was used as their ecology lab. When I first got the house, it took us two and a half years to get the mold and the mildew out of the lower level so we could even come down and function there. Uh, we used over 55 gallons of bleach just to kill the mold. Um, it was, the things that Bill and I went through are the, the average person could not comprehend. Uh, it, it's just, it's amazing. Uh, and you think back about it, and I look back, I have over 8,000 pictures of the house, all, all the work, all the various stages. And when I look back through the pictures, and I do from time to time, and when there's a, a group, when it goes back to actual groups looking through the houses, I have basically a slideshow that runs on a TV uh, during the, fair, or during the uh, showing. But I look at that and I realize that I am certifiably crazy. <laughs> Suzanne, there's a couple of questions I can see here if you don't Good, mind. Good, because I'm I, having I, a lot of, I'm now having technical difficulties. Okay. So yes, yeah, so so if you can, A couple of questions. I'm going to share my screen again um, and the black bar will reappear. And I apologize. I have no idea why it's hanging out there today. But anyways, that's uh, some contact information for you. A couple of things uh, we mentioned that we're going to have the, the virtual tour. Uh, coming up here, uh, November 7th. So our website, indianalandmarks.org is up there. And my email, if you have other questions or you want more information, please uh, make sure you reach out. I'm glad to try and answer additional questions. And one of the folks, and I love this question, we should put it up there all the time. Is there anything they can do to help support our efforts? And that's absolutely, uh, our website there is a great place to go. We have some information. If you look at House of Tomorrow that you could donate or assist that way, that'd be awesome. Um, we are moving forward on that project. So yeah, be a member. That's the best way to support us. Uh, we are a membership organization. We rely on our, our friends that are members to help us do this work. Unfortunately, it doesn't go to uh, the Beatties or, the, or to uh, Ross to help them out, but it helps, uh, helps Landmarks. So uh, I would encourage you to join if you can. Uh, the website's there. My email's there. Glad to chat with you uh, in the future. Uh, hopefully that answers a couple things I wanted to, to, to note. So Suzanne, also, you want to cover? also, if I could add, Bill and I have a GoFundMe page. <laughs> I think this is when we need to mute Ross. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> right. Well, and, and uh, just with a, the minute we have left, just a reminder that we are recording this uh, technical difficulties and everything, and we'll send it out. We'll send a link to everybody that registered. So you can have that. Please feel free to share that pe with people. Uh, 
the more we can educate, the more people we can get knocking on these uh, Lucy's doors, the better. But yeah. but it, it it really is important, and and we want everybody to know what a tremendous save it is, and everything that's gone into it. So. Um, with that, sorry we didn't get to all these questions, uh, but uh, Todd Zeiger works for Indiana Landmarks and we've got a website, indianalandmarks.org, so you can track him down and ask questions. And certainly hope to see all of you in person in 2021, fingers crossed for an in-person tour. So thanks uh, to the Beatties and to Ross and to Todd and to everybody who joined us. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.